All right. Thanks everyone for coming to the first and so far only live uh, episode yeah. of Another Blank Page, uh, the world building podcast that Tracy and I do. Yeah. Um, if you're unfamiliar with it, which shame on you, but that's fine. Not everyone knows about all the things on the internet. Um, what do we do on this world building podcast, Tracy? Uh, we build a world one blank page at a time, right? So if you imagine uh, a wiki that starts with nothing, we filled out the first episode and we highlighted four topics from that episode that we thought would be interesting. And then we picked one of those topics to do for the next episode. And all of this happens more or less in the world we're building at the same frozen moment in time. Yeah, um, we really focus on a lot more uh, almost physical anthropology. Um, it's, I think you've, you've described it as like archeology, span but without all of the really unpleasant colonialist stuff in it. Yeah, because it's a world that we're making up, so we're in charge of our own implications and assumptions. Yeah, we're not projecting our own biases on these things because our biases are baked into their reality. Exactly. Oops. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Whoop. Um, so we started this all uh, sometime last year. Uh, March 18th of 2019 was the first uh, episode date. I looked it up the other day. <laughs> yeah, Tracy basically uh, DM'd me on Twitter and was like, hey, you want to do a thing? And I'm like, I don't know what this thing is, but sure, let's go do it. And it worked really well. It did. Uh, and it all started with a goblin. Yeah. Uh, that was our, our starting point. We, we just said, okay, I'm go we're going to start with a goblin. And then we described the scene around that goblin and it quickly became absolutely non-standard fantasy. Uh, and the topics that we started pulling off of the different episodes varied from really exciting and epic and, and awesome and full of implication to the most mundane, minutia-filled sort of things, which leads us into, Kate, what's today's topic? Uh, today's topic is a remnant of one of our uh, previous episodes where we visited a, a group of people who were um, basically having a, a festival and one of the core concepts of their culture was to share food with one another. Mm -hmm. And in order to do so, um, you need a lot of little like paper food containers. Yeah, that's our topic today. <laughs> paper food containers. <laughs> and it, it's one of those things about world building that um, you don't really think about. Like everyone wants to go to, oh, here's this amazing like grave of saints where the magic blah, blah, blah lives. And um, all of that's fed by all of the mundane like details of a world, like the, the direction the rivers run, the, the type of um, flora that grow in like arid areas, all of that like contributes to every decision that everyone in that world makes about how they live their lives. Exactly, and so while it may seem uh, like, okay, I'm seriously going to sit in a room and listen to people talk about paper food containers for an hour. Yes, you are, and you're going to love it. <laughs> we hope. We hope. I'm, um, I'm pretty confident. <laughs> if you do not enjoy it, uh, you will get your money back for what you paid to listen to this uh, particular podcast, not the convention. You've already paid for that. Um, so, um, paper food containers. We, we saw them in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. episode. Um, they were at that sort of fair uh, event. Where else in the world do paper food containers like that appear? Sure. Um, so when you talk about paper food containers, you have a couple embedded um, like assumptions about what these are. Mm -hmm. They're probably handheld. Yeah. They're probably made out of a relatively cheap material because mm -hmm. no one would um, really go for something very expensive. Yeah. Uh, so what other situations would lead to um, paper food containers existing, right? Like we see them in our world in um, like street markets. Mm -hmm. We see them at festivals. We see them at sporting events. Um, but there are 
there are other places that, um, that we could put them in our world. Because the idea is you want to grab a thing and carry it around and you do not have a plate or a, a bowl or something like to sit down with. Right. So you could see it at, hmm. I'm gonna say that uh, this is at a beach. Okay. So. Um, it's a beach episode. It is a beach That's episode. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, that means everyone's gonna get in swimsuits. It's gonna uh -huh. be grand. Yes. Um, but uh, I think a lot about the paper snow cone cones yeah. that you get at beaches, like mm -hmm. um, somewhere in Hawaii. What, what does this beach look like, Tracy? Uh, so I, I don't think that it is, so in, in like the American conception of a beach, we think about soft sand beaches usually because that is what the, the bulk of the American coastline that people visit for beach vacations think of. Um, I remember when I was in high school and we took a trip to, to France, we were down in Nice for a day and I saw a Mediterranean beach for the first time and it was just gray pebbles. Mm -hmm. And I was a little taken aback, like I didn't quite know what to do <laughs> right. with that information. Uh, I also, it was like 45 degrees out so I couldn't like mm -hmm. enjoy the beach so I couldn't factor that into any conception I had of, oh, a good beach can also be pebbles. Yeah. But let's, this, let's make this a pebbled beach. Can I make the pebbles a little weird? Of course. Can they be bones? Yes, they can be bones. So here in Washington, I haven't had a chance to take you here. Uh, Tracy's visiting from Ohio. Um, but here in Washington, we have driftwood beaches. Okay. Um, there's lots of seashells, there's lots of pieces of driftwood, there's lots of pebbles. Sure. Um, but I think in, in an echo of our driftwood beaches, this is, this is a beach where there are a lot of bleached white bones. Okay. Um, what, what types of creatures do these bones come from? So it's going to be a variety of creatures, right? Because marine life is wildly diverse. Mm -hmm. And to have there be some kind of monoculture is, is really boring. So I like the idea of it being a number of shelled animals, not like crustacean shell, mm -hmm. but like sea turtle oh, okay. shell. So there are, are, are big, like protective armor-like plates that are common enough that they're that they're they're washing up and they're getting dried out, uh, and then I would say, what you would expect from from any variety of marine life. There are fish skeletons. There are other uh, sort of mammalian or reptilian things. So the bones are thicker and heavier than fish bones are. Mm -hmm. uh, how splintery does this stuff get on this beach? Like. Are we talking you need protective footwear when you're out there or? I, I think it's strange because paper food containers exist on this beach, right? Yeah, so, so this people, is a beach for, re for recreation yeah, of some so type. Yeah, so people must go here. You don't want to have to like wear protective shoes okay, so, when you're going to this beach. Okay, so let's, let's, let's dial that back for a yeah. second. What kind of people are visiting this beach? Because our world obviously doesn't have just human stand-ins. We've done all kinds of stuff yeah. for sentient races. So what kinds of beings would use paper food containers for recreation, but also not have to worry about protective footwear? I think it would be, it, it has to be either a race of, of creatures, a uh, species of creature that either A, doesn't have feet to care about getting punctured or otherwise whatever. So sure either pseudopods or whatever, or has such heavily armored like uh, appendages that yeah. it's not even an issue. Um, let's go with heavily armored. Let's, let's have some, some walking tanks okay. on, our, on our beach. So, <laughs> so this beach, uh, let's, let's this paint be a, This beach is a nightmare and I love it. Yeah, let, let's paint a picture of this beach. Um, I, I guess, let me ask you a question before we do. Uh -huh. um, is this an ancient beach? Like, are all of these skeletons ancient? Are all these creatures ancient? 
or is this something that that like new stuff washes up all the time in various states of decay? I, I'm I'm gonna my own sensibilities I think will not allow me to have rot that much rotting beach material going on here. So I'm going to say that it is an ancient beach. I think there are things that I mean every beach has stuff dying on it sure. like there's all kinds of stuff that doesn't make it back to the ocean and subsequently decays in, in whatever kind of beach you're talking about but i think in this case apart from the everyday stuff the things that wash up that make up the componenture of the beach wash up with a lot of the organic material already stripped okay right so like when you have a whale fall in deep in the ocean and yeah. all the marine life just it's a smorgasbord and you're left with this relatively picked clean skeleton. Mm -hmm. Imagine that kind of thing being what washes up if something does. So that leads me to ask a couple questions. Yeah. Um, bones are typically pretty heavy. Mm -hmm. How are these bones floating, washing to the surface that they are new, that they are getting to the shore? Are these bones of creatures that have light or hollow bones? I think it is, it's a couple of things, because one of the things we like to do is if we have multiple ideas, we'll just jam them together. So I like the idea of the bones, they're able to be hollowed out, mm. right? Like even human bones, are they're dense, but there's that soft, squishy marrow bit in the middle. But I think there is some type of marine life that will burrow into the center of these bones and eat out all that goodness and then leave leave them like I'm I'm not saying intact skeletons or what no, are washing up, no, but like not. we get lighter bones coming in and it's also in an echo to the the Patreon episode that we just did, it's pretty salinous water, so stuff will float more yeah. easily than it otherwise. Wood. I like the idea of um, weird little sea creatures making bone balloons. Uh huh. Uh, basically, by by eating out all the marrow and like other nutrition inside of yeah. The so so if like something big dies in the ocean and and sinks down, just like in our world, it gets consumed by a huge variety of of life, mm -hmm. and then as that organic material is stripped away there are things that begin, say in like a larval stage even, begin to burrow into the bone and as they eat the things, the entire thing starts to rise up to the surface and then they exit at some point in time mm -hmm. and leave these very light, hollowed out bones that just get washed, washed up. That leads me to ask, are these the creatures that, that eat the whatever in the bones, mm -hmm. are they edible themselves? Oh, uh, there's, it's way more fun if they are. So sure. Okay. Is that what's in the paper food containers? Are we, are we going full, full circle here on we this? We might do, because, because I'm thinking of like clam digs and mm -hmm. like, um, like crab cookouts and things on the sure. beach, right? Like you go to a place, you get a bunch of the local produce, you put it in a thing and then you just hand it out to your friends or... So whatever these beings are who can party on, on Bone Beach, they aren't waiting for these skeletons to get washed ashore. They might be swimming out mm -hmm. and like going and getting skeletons where whatever being inside has not yet exited hauling the whole thing back, forcibly removing the denizen of the bones, yeah. and frying it up. Yeah, uh, I guess in a sort of nod to archaeology, this is the equivalent of a shell mound. Yeah. Where, you know, you get all of the leftover things from, from cooking, and uh, so this doesn't seem like a permanent situation, right? It doesn't seem like this seems maybe seasonal. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah. Like I, one, one of the things being out here in Seattle that I'm a little bit sad about is that I'm not here in a month that ends in ER. Like I'm not <laughs> going to ask about oysters because I know it's not the time to ask about oysters, Sure. but I, I love oysters and they're very seasonal. So 
I think it's, it's that same kind of thing, that there's a life cycle to whatever is being consumed from these bones, that right around this time of, of year in our world, this is when that harvest can happen. Mm. So th- that said, uh, the folks, do the folks that are partying on Bone Beach, are they there to party on Bone Beach? Are they there to harvest? Because if they're there just to harvest and this happens to be a situation where they cook out and stuff, they don't need to be necessarily like, you know, armored up enough to be True. like yeah. leaning back on all of this <laughs> pile of uh, sharp these bones. Ah, feels so good on my scales, yeah. Um, I like the idea of this being, it's a long-term thing for, in terms of like spending a day, mm. right? Because you go out early in the morning and you find the skeletons that you need mm-hmm. that have whatever this thing is inside of them and you haul them back and you're hauling back enough to act as a food source for whatever community you are, you're feeding with this but you're there and if you're part of an industry like that, you know the best ways to eat them fresh and you're going to either treat yourself because you worked really hard for this so why not have some fresh catch or there's a ritualistic component to it of we got this thing and now we will cook it and eat it as a community of gatherers Mm -hmm. so on and so forth so i don't think they're necessarily lounging on the beach sure so maybe there is just yeah some like leather protective like leather wraps around their feet yeah. or whatever the rest of them looks like. They've got some protection to be able to venture out out here and do this thing. Can they, can they be a family that is enjoying this first catch of yeah. the season? I definitely think so. We can even, like if we want to have like the sun setting down on the horizon and everything be golden hour too, that would be great. Sure, I would because love that. We, we can choose the moment in time that we're looking at this, Yeah. right? So if we were looking at the, the freeze frame of the situation, this like gold wash on this like beach strewn with all of these bones, large and small, mm-hmm. um, maybe a couple of the family members wading out of the water, like arms full Laden of, with bones laden and water. with like, squirming things out of the yeah. bones, perhaps. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely thinking some type of remora-like, very mouth-centric thing that actually can, in small form, dig into the bones real tiny, mm-hmm. and then it literally grows to be the size of the interior of these of these bones. I'm not saying hagfish, but, but what if? But, but, what, but, if but what if? But what, what if hagfish? I mean, every single episode is going to come back to hagfish. <laughs> now you've mentioned it once, and it's hagfish all the way down. Yeah. Um, I. I'm fine with that. I, that prompts me to ask a question, though. Hagfish um, have that slimy, nasty mm-hmm. goopiness around them. These things have literally a protective carapace yeah. that they grow into. It's it's like uh, a hermit crab, right? right. So, do what's in place of that goopiness? Like, because it's evolutionarily not necessary. I think. I think it doesn't have the goopiness. I think they burrow into these bones whenever they need to change, uh, to change carapaces, right? Okay. Like, so they're normally soft on the inside. Mm-hmm. And so anytime they grow bigger, they just get no a new one. So they're okay. actually pretty tender. All right, awesome. So, because one thing that I've been wondering about is how these are functionally cooked mm-hmm. like for, for immediate consumption and then how they're preserved and stored and used later. So what does the, the fresh preparation of these things look like? Because I, I think it is, our camera's focused on this one family that we just defined, mm-hmm. right? But I think if we sort of just pan the camera left and right up and down the shores of the beach, there are other familial groups who are doing the same thing. So yeah. we can zoom over to different parts of this process and see whatever we, whatever we need to. So. Um, since they are kind of like burrowed in these hard shell bones, Mm -hmm. um, the best way to get things cooked in those is just to 
boil the whole thing. Yeah. Um, in a lot of places, when you're boiling like snails or other things, you just put them in a big pot, and then when they're cooked, you take out a skewer of mm -hmm. some sort, and then you jab them in, and you pull out the, the delicious good bits. OK. Um, and I think this is a similar type situation where um, they probably have some sort of special utensil, mm -hmm. uh, but a disposable one yeah. that they can use to fish out whatever these creatures are and, and start munching on them. What does this utensil look like? Uh, I think it is something that can attach to whatever mouth bit the creature has. Like, I think there are some relatively sharp teeth. It might be mm -hmm. the only hard part of this creature. Sure. Um, and so I think it is like a small, uh, like a small basket of woven reeds or grass that can be turned to tighten the weave so it thins out mm -hmm. and you put it in and then you turn it the other way and the weave opens up and it catches huh. on the teeth parts and then you can just pull it out and drop the reed and let it be. Huh. That's like, that's like like a reverse finger trap. Yeah, uh, that's wild. Um, okay, so these these reed utensils mm -hmm. probably are grown nearby. Yeah, I, I would think even with a, a bone beach like this, when you get far enough away from the water, things break down even more into component pieces that become soil, mm -hmm. right? And beach grasses and things like that grow in loose soil that is made up of whatever. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would imagine that, that uh, oh, can there be like bone dust dunes that like yeah. lead up well, from these I, with... I, I definitely think so. Like as, as the wind kind of grinds down on mm -hmm. these... Um, God, this place must be terrible on the eyes and throat and nose. Yeah, because everything is going to be, all the particulates really light and not dense. Yeah. It's, so it's bright white. Right. Like, everyone has to have some protective eyewear on of some kind. And maybe you can only really do this at the time of day we're doing it when things are golden and easier on the eyes because the heat would be intense too right it would just be pure reflection of whatever radiation is coming down from our <laughs> yeah assumed you, you get bone tans and then like bone blind <laughs> uh i i heard about um this person this young person who um got really into carving like bone pipes okay and like scrimshaw type yeah but he, he would not ever use a respirator and he ended up like coming down with like bone lung bone lung and died <laughs> oh, oh my god straight up died um so i think that these these beings have some type of masks that are like sitting discarded at the base of the dunes mm -hmm. because the winds come in from offshore and blow the dunes up so when they get down to the actual beach they take off their their masks and they tie on their leather foot things. They've already gathered the grasses on their way down mm -hmm. the dunes. And so you've got the, the strongest, most able-bodied are the ones who do the swimming out and capturing of the bones. You've got another group who are like building a fire and putting on boiling water. Yeah. Is I, it, are, they, are they hauling a cauldron down for um, that? So you, you, you've mentioned that uh, there are like turtle like creatures. Holy, yes, there are. That's amazing. So there is a, probably a giant half shell of a large turtle creature that had washed up on that beach. There's probably a bunch of them all over. Yeah. They kind of look like giant bumps or scoops, um, depending on which way they're oriented. And it's resting on maybe a, a little makeshift oven mm -hmm. made out of stone and other larger like femurs and things, fire underneath water boiling in the middle. I would also like there to be from that. So if, if you think about like the, the oven type, the kiln like building, uh -huh. um, there should be a place where like more uh, 
combustible material can be fed into it. Mm -hmm. And out from that, I'd like there to be like a spill of hot coals and another smaller fire where some of the smaller bones where the creatures inside aren't as big mm -hmm. and won't boil and preserve as well. The bones are just tossed on their hole and mm -hmm. they're roasted inside of that. And that's like the treat of the day. You get it fresh and you get it roasted. Yeah. Uh, because roasted bones are delicious. Yeah. And so why not impart that flavor into whatever, you know, hagfish type being you're consuming that day. Okay. <laughs> uh, what, what does this place smell like? It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> to us anyway. Like, I think that if you and I were, were visiting this place, like, the sea has a particular kind of mm -hmm. tang to it anyway. Right. And things of the sea very much carry that yeah, tang that with them. Yeah, that briny, iodine-y yeah. type smell. And then you're boiling that. And the ready source of water, they're not hauling potable water down mm -hmm. for this. They're, I mean, like they're salting it like you're supposed to salt pasta water. They're using seawater for this. So right. you've got boiling seawater. And then these things, whatever they happen to smell like... I'm just sure they smell delicious. To <laughs> people who rely upon them for sustenance, I'm sure that they do. There are plenty of things in the world that are consumed by people who eat them for survival that would make me gag. And mm -hmm. they're just like, nope, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have this now. Mm -hmm. So Hot dogs. There you go. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so... <laughs> I love hot dogs, by the way. The hot dogs are grand. Um, <laughs> no, no shame on hot dogs. Uh, the thing is, if if this is a if this is an event, if they are if they are coming down and they're excited about this, mm -hmm. um, they're probably bringing things to make the, this taste better. Yeah, for sure. What kind of seasonings or, or other ingredients are they adding to this to this boil? This, so I automatically think about citrus when I think seafood, mm -hmm. right? Because the two pair really well together. And I would imagine that there's some, you know, yuzu-like thick-rinded citrus fruit that mm -hmm. carries well, stores pretty well, that they can pick wherever they are away from the beach and they can bring it down with them. Uh, and they can squeeze the juice or use zest sure. or, or whatever. Uh, as part of it, I think that they keep the shell that they used from last year because uh -huh. they keep the fire going until it's all reduced down and you've got salt okay. at the bottom of it. Yeah. Um, and so they can scrape that off and, and use that to... Uh, as, sort of like a mother mm -hmm. like broth starter, right? Yeah. Like you start with last year's boil yeah. extract. Yeah, last year's last year's uh, hero and a half shell, and <laughs> right. <laughs> um, you, bringing up yuzu mm -hmm. um, citrus leads me to ask it, a, a question that I'm not sure we're prepared to answer. I like those. Let's go. Is this is this in an area that's tropical or? Is there enough of a logistics network that they can get uh, tropical fruit to where they are? Because, like, what I'm when I think of bone beaches, I don't necessarily think of a tropical environment, right? Right. So, let me let me say both yes and no. Let me alter the state of the citrus okay. that they're using a little bit. I think that it has been preserved like preserved lemon, mm -hmm. right? Uh, for those that may not know, you just literally take a lemon, you cut it into corners, you scrape out some of the pulp, you jam it into a jar with a bunch of salt and you let it sit for six weeks and it's delicious. You can chop it up and use it in all kinds of stuff. It's its, its own salad dressing, it, it's wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think that they do something very similar with the salt from the inside of the shell and they get citrus from someplace, mm -hmm. but at a different time of year so they use some of the the salt from last year's boil to preserve this whatever the citrus is to be able to bring down for this event yeah. so i i think there is a trade network that can get them citrus and when they have it they do it that way uh, i don't know that it's in every 
events kind of thing. Yeah. I think that there are, uh, maybe it's been, excuse me, maybe it's been a, a, a banner year this year mm -hmm. and they've got extra citrus and whatever other seasonings they're bringing along with them, you know, dried herbs and, and things of that nature. Yeah. So. Uh, that, that sounds delicious, honestly. Like I could go for weird. Preserve, preserve pre citrus. Preserve citrus, hagfish boil. Yeah, mm -hmm. 100%. I would try it at least once. <laughs> um, bringing our discussion back to the paper food containers. Yeah. To me, the, I, the existence of a paper food container implies sharing mm -hmm. with people who are not going to give back whatever you gave them. Yeah, no, that's, that's true because it, it, it has almost like a, a vendor buyer sort of situation. Or even a sharing situation. Yeah. So my question is, with, with the food that's put in these, these paper food containers, instead of just eating it straight from the bone or mm -hmm. straight from the, the pot, yeah, right. why, why take it out and prep it and season it and then put it in containers? Who's it going to? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so there are these uh, traders that have just suddenly come up who bring the citrus, right. right? So I think that for wherever this region is in the world, the, the, the people who come by to bring trade goods come by at minimum twice a year, mm -hmm. right? Once in the just after the warmer months when the harvest has happened and that's when they bring the citrus mm -hmm. and then once just after the colder months once roads are passable again assuming a regular sure. cyclical seasonal cycle so i think that this is happening just as things are getting warm enough mm -hmm. and the people who do the trading who are not part of this culture but who are symbiotically re associated with mm -hmm. it are brought down to the beach for this celebration saying, look, here's what we did with the citrus that you, that you gave us mm -hmm. last year. And we know that you have traded away some of the preserved hagfish that we boiled out and salted or whatever we yeah. did with it as, as a, an export. So here you've been good to us. This is the, this is what it's like fresh. This is our festival of this here. Have some. Okay, so this is a this is a special event type celebrating this relationship between these two groups of people. Yeah, and it, maybe it happens annually. Maybe uh -huh. the, maybe there's that much baked in tradition of this. Maybe it's the first time. I, I'm not entirely. Do you have a preference? Uh, I I think I think it's probably the first time. Okay. Um, because this feels again with a sort of paper food containers. Mm -hmm. This feels less like a tradition that you plan for and have like ceremony around sure. and more like a, hey, hey, I want to share this with you. Yeah. You, we, we've been trading together for X number of years. Yeah. You are used to our goods. Let's, we're going to show you what this is like. Welcome to our, our world for a little bit. Yeah. I, I, think, I think maybe somewhere on the other end of the trade route is a reciprocal uh, type situation somewhere in the future. Sure. Um, where these cultures are, are choosing to share their traditions with one another mm -hmm. because they are friendly and familiar with each other enough that they trust. Yeah, that the, they're, they're doing some intentional cultural osmosis. They're, they're literally opening the door and inviting in. Yeah. Rather than just having it bleed through by, pro by proximity. Yeah, I think... So with that in mind, I think if you look up and down the beach, mm -hmm. there are many families of this original type of uh, this original culture, um, but only this one specific one that we're looking at has the, the food in the paper containers and are sharing it with the people. Right, here. because everyone else is just eating it, getting it prepped for, you know, the, the trek back up the, the dune. Mm -hmm. what have you. So what makes this, like what visually, aside from the fact that the traders are now with them, what visually sets this family apart? I think this family, uh, this family has less than the others. Okay. Um, they're, they're not as well off. Um, they're, you can see that the implements that they brought down, the utensils, their, their clothes, they're all in a state of um, like mended like they're very 
used, well-worn, um, constantly patched, uh, where all the other ones, like, they have, you know, bright new togs for this, like, beach event, right? Mm -hmm. The there's an equivalent of the like summer in the Hamptons family right down the beach sure. with a like a big pavilion and like maybe some people that they pay to go wade out into the water and get this stuff for them. Yeah. I I like that difference and I also want to float something to you. Mm -hmm. I think that the repaired clothes and the the lack of overt finery is actually the sign of the family that sort of wields political power mm. in the area. Like, I think that it's a sign, it's like servant leadership. Like, I, I don't like a lot of the trappings that that word ha that phrase sure. has in our world, but it's the idea that to be a leader, you have to be subservient to the needs of the community. Mm -hmm. And as a sign of that, you're not getting all the finery, you're repairing things that could be replaced, mm -hmm. but instead you're choosing to repair it to show your devotion to the ideals that your community has. Does sure. that, does yeah. that work? It, it does. And it also, um, it brings to mind this, this conflict between, uh, the folks that are ostentatious, ostent, ostentatiously, that's a word. Yes, it is. Ostentatiously <laughs> showing their wealth and power versus these more humble, um, like, uh, but in a, a position of leadership. I feel like if you look at the society, they are one in transition. Mm -hmm. You have these, this family that we're looking at who are sort of bastions of traditional values, who are like, here are the old ways, here are our values, we are humble people, we share what we have, um, and then there are the folks down the lane who are like, well, why can't we just get rich? Why can't we just like enjoy all of the wealth of, of our world and show off what we have because like we deserve to. Mm -hmm. And so I think baked into this, um, this this little strip of beach is a generational slash class conflict. Mm -hmm. um, who are the two representatives of, of each clan that are, that are most likely to, to go lock horns over this? I think that they are, they're from the, the sort of two groups that are closest to where our fictional camera is set up, right? I think there is uh, a, a person of middle age, who is part of the uh, the sharing group? I'll just call them. Mm -hmm. uh, who has the traders and is and is offering of you know the, the the prepared foods in the paper containers, and then probably 50 or fewer yards down the beach, there is uh, a, a group. I think the family leaders are younger mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, but definitely sort of peacocking about. All of this, and I think there are the the current uh, sort of shabbily dressed leadership. I think they're not really worried about what's going on down the beach. They're focused on the importance of this tradition and sharing the the ritual nature of this with the traders. But the ones who are trying to flaunt what they have are continually looking down the beach at the the actual leaders because their continued adherence to the old ways, quote mm -hmm. unquote, is like a thorn in their side. Yeah. Like, even though I don't think there's anything that the current leadership has done to say what you're doing is bad and you shouldn't do it. Right. They're letting it happen. Yeah. But the fact that that's who's in power yeah. just sticks in the craw of the rich folks. Well, basically. they're they're stodgy. They're old. They're they're making everyone think that our our clothes are terrible and bad and like so. There is this there is this notion there that like there there may be not a direct uh, cause for their ire, right? Other than just the we want to present better. 
we, we want to join the rest of whatever this, this world is. This, this, this chunk of the world, that, yeah. Yeah, and, and prove that we are advanced, modern, or, or like maybe you see some people here wearing clothing that we've seen from other parts of our world. Yeah, for sure. Like whatever the new modern trends are, like maybe I see someone sporting some of those like bug eye glasses. I, I think that's a really good callback, especially because of the dunes mm -hmm. and how bright it is out here. So I think that they're, because they can be carved from bone too. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, that's definitely people are wearing the, the sunglasses mm -hmm. that are, you know, latticed with holes or slits, you know, so, yeah. so they can... They can show, yeah, we no, we we traded for those. We're mm -hmm. we're hip. <laughs> yeah, these. If you look at the side, they have the predator bird carved on them. Mm -hmm. These are clearly the like, what are those gamer goggles that people have that are like yellow? Mm -hmm. uh, those, right? Yeah, the equivalent of those sold to these dude bros <laughs> who are like sitting in this pavilion. Yeah, did we did. Did we just make like Seattle Tech dude bros out on Bone Beach? We we already have done that. We already have done that. Uh, I don't hate them. And they're in this, at least this instance, they're yeah. not necessarily doing anything bad or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just that the emotional intensity that I'm getting from like imagining them in this scene. Mm -hmm is so out of proportion to what's actually happening. Right. And it just seems unnecessary on their part. And yet, they persist. And if you look further down the beach, um, there are sort of like unaffiliated families yeah. that haven't really, they keep their heads down, but they're paying attention to what's going on. They, like, there's a reason that the Dude Bro Pavilion set up right next to Humbletown. I have a feeling that whatever passes for a local election happens not too long from now. Mm -hmm. And whether or not it is an official, like, campaigning event or not, the Beach Boil is such a pivotal part of this culture's fabric that people will reference what happened during that event when they're debating the merits of who should lead. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the, the beach bros, for lack of a better term, are trying to leverage this event in a way that it maybe hasn't been leveraged before, mm -hmm. where the current leaders, they, you know what, they may also be doing that a little bit. Oh yeah, because what, inviting the traders down is a power play, right? It's yeah. Oh, that they're canny. I like them a lot. Yeah, I don't think anyone here is like the the most like pure, humble essence like monk society. Like <laughs> no, there's no there's no asceticism going on no, here. No, like, like people here are are doing things for their best interest. Yeah, or what they believe to be is the best interest of their group, and and their society as a whole. And, and I think that is an important distinction to make between what we're seeing here and people who are out for self-interest alone. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. They're completely acting in a manner that they think will benefit everybody. Yeah. Yeah, the rich people are probably going to benefit a little bit more. I'm sure the people in power get some side benefits yeah. from being in power. It's, it's not it's not completely altruistic, but they still have the community in mind because yeah. I don't want to make some you know vapid hollow power grabbing kind of society no. with this so I, I definitely think this is this is purely a like battle for the the future of this society mm -hmm. and whether it is a sort of like a little bit more uh, capitalistic bend to it or a more sort of like egalitarian bartering society bend to it it's it's kind of up in the air right now yeah and this is a, an interesting inflection point that we have sort of stumbled across mm -hmm. in this moment because a lot of the uh, societies that we've described so far in other pages we've explored are very established mm -hmm. in their ways and when we talk we've talked about 
why they're doing the things we see them doing in the scenes, it's because of very established traditions and there's not as much uh, disruption mm -hmm. going on. We've had some pretty conflicted moments, yeah. but this speaks to a, 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 a change for this society that has been building for a while. Mm -hmm. What are the physical signs that this change has has precipitated? I think that it's reflected in the other families scattered up and down the beach and how they're dressed and how they're interacting. Mm -hmm. They're not doing what they're doing for a public display the way that both the beach bros and the current leadership are. Mm -hmm. But there are some who have on the new sunglasses. Um, there are some whose manner of dress is patched and repaired. And it's almost like you can draw faction lines based on who's wearing the newest, latest, greatest, mm -hmm. and who is fixing up last year's shoes. Yeah. And, 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 there, and there may be some people who actually don't care, who are like, oh, my eyes are getting really sore every time we do this. I'm going to spend my extra coin on a pair of these fancy glasses, and I'll repair last year's shoes. Mm -hmm. But I think in general, how they're dressed is, is really showing a stark divide. Like if you were to, to zoom out and you have these two families that we've described as a frame of reference, uh -huh. you could like gather polling data. Right. I wonder, of the, of the ones that you described, mm -hmm. maybe, there's a, maybe there's a third faction. Okay. What are they, what, how are they visually different than the other two? I think the third faction has actually decided to um, forego this like ceremony on the beach. Oh, so they're not, are there like holes, gaps in this line yeah. where you would have everyone pretty much evenly spaced going down the beach and then there are just families not present? Yeah, I think I think there are there are groups that maybe find this whole peacocking pony show to be distasteful. Okay. Like deeply distasteful. Like these are these are traditions that are important to us and you shouldn't be using these as a place to to fight out this this conflict. Okay, so we've had the camera focused on the two families and the stretch of the beach, if we pick it up and we turn it around and throw it over the dunes mm -hmm. and follow it through the trails that lead through, you know, across, you know, let's just say grassland that mm -hmm. connects up, where do we see these not attending families? Like, what are they doing in this moment? I think, I think they are choosing to eat the preserved ones from last year. Okay. Uh, I, I, think, I think in, in their own sort of political commentary, uh, they are back with wherever their village is mm -hmm. um, or town or whatever settlement that they live in. Yeah. Um, and they are having a, their own quiet gathering of multiple families, but they're sharing like their preserved things from last year. And it's, it's a lot more modest. Mm -hmm. um, but is in such a way that like is also a clear political statement. I uh, I'd like to add a twist to that if sure. if I can. I think that they're doing this at sort of the edge of whatever their town or mm -hmm. settlement is on the opposite side from where the ocean is, and I think they've got things packed up to leave. I think they're. I think. I think they're heading out. So they're they're they're, they're fed up. With they're, us. They are. They are done. Like this speaks to a lot of of much deeper uh, and and more bitter divides than I think we're going to have time to get into today. But mm -hmm. I think that they're sharing some of last year's preserved mm -hmm. catch because it's travel food. 
That's okay. what, that's what you eat on the road. Yeah. And so they're saying very symbolically this is us moving on from right from 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 this experience. This isn't the place we want to be anymore. And I don't think they gave any indication that that was going to be the case. Mm -hmm. So when the parties come back from the beach, they're going to find empty houses or dwellings or whatever. Yeah, I, I think I think their absence was is already noted. Yep. In the beach area, but it's a oh, they're just being petulant. I think there's one person who knows they're not going to be back, and I think in one of the other families mm -hmm. during the stretch of beach, there's a. There's a child who's like playing with a toy mm -hmm. that is like part of a, a pair of toys, kind of like, you know, uh, the locket, ne the heart sure. necklaces. Yeah. And as the camera spins back to the, to the settlement, there's another child who has like the obvious other half of that that's leaving with a family. Like the kid knows they were going to go and they're the only one who really knows that's going to happen, but they have no idea what the implications of that are. Right. They just know their friend's going to be gone. Oh, that's really sad. Yeah. Um, this feels like whatever, whatever meal that these, um, that these departing people are having, it feels very strongly of, of a, the establishment of a new ritual. Yeah, like this feels, you know, like, a, like this is our, our meal before our exodus. Yeah, um, and I think that the, it could mean a lot of different things that I would love to see where we come up with stuff in the future. But like, yeah, uh, they're, they're, they're setting up something new. They're, they're trying to forge something that they think is better than what they've currently got. Mm. Um. You don't leave a place that is comfortable. Right. What, what aspects of the life that they're leaving behind are so unpleasant or dire? Other than people can l live in toxic situations for a very long time. You don't yeah. pick up your whole family and go just because like all your neighbors are just yelling at each other. Right. Um, I'm not sure, to be honest, because I have... My, my, my experience living in the world we live in, I don't have a frame of reference really for yeah. what could be so bad that an entire group of people says, no, we're done. So I'm open to ideas. I feel like this could be a Rust Belt type situation. Where, where people are clinging to a way of life that is not going to yeah. last. Yeah, I think, I think this this feast on the bone beach is is one that is a celebration that they enjoy but it's not related to their main livelihood their main way of of persisting this is just a bright blip in an otherwise pretty gray and dreary and hard rot life yeah i i think then maybe some signs of that are uh as as the camera is moving through those grasslands it passes like farmlands mm -hmm. and places where the ground has been broken up with plows and you can see that the soil is almost bone white it's made of a lot of the same stuff mm -hmm. that the beach was and it doesn't grow things yeah. well i think that it, it's it's lacking in basic nutrients that they used to be able to supplant in other ways yeah. that are gone now um like i'm thinking like oklahoma dust bowl yeah. like so with, with you saying that, um, I'm kind of imagining uh, the Bone Beach differently. Okay. It's instead of just a long stretch of beach, it's actually a series of beaches along the the delta mm -hmm. of a river that you see used to be very wide, but is now like trickled down to a very narrow stream. Yeah. So they're they're, they're losing the sort of silt flood that used to make croplands viable mm -hmm. and now th all of those nutrients have just been leached out over generations and they are struggling to survive but the two factions down at the beach won't 
won't hear of it. This yeah. is what we do. Yeah. Okay. I think that's. Uh, I, I think that's what's causing these people to leave. It, it's it's literally a, a dust bowl situation. Yeah. Are there any last details that you want to add? Because we are coming up on our hour, and so we need to pull some pages for the next episode and see if the folks out here have any questions. Sure. Um, I, I don't necessarily have any details that I'd like to add to that. Okay. Um, but I'd like to. I'd like to thank you for making a dope ass bone beach dust bowl situation with me. Oh yeah, like I. We never quite know where these are going to go when we start these things, and this has be this is one of the coolest ones we've made in a little while. Mm -hmm. And I, we we kind of uh, did a reflection episode for our previous recording, and I like that this is what we came back with. Yeah, is is something uh, that started off weird and celebratory, and ended up really poignant. Yeah. So, um, what pages do you want to? call out from this? Um, I'd like to call out the, the origin of the preserved citrus. Um, I think that would be an interesting thing to explore. If you've never listened to any of these shows before, like I'm the one that's always going to pick the most mundane thing. Like I think one episode I it was like ubiquitous wooden stools or yep. something <laughs> like. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It was, it was literally ubiquitous wooden stools. Yeah. Um, uh, Cool. I'm going to call out the companion toys. Okay. Because uh, I really like that idea. Um, what is your second one? Um, my second one is going to be the uh, origin of the bones. So whatever fauna that produce, uh, let, let's say the origin of the shell, right? Like whatever weird turtle man <laughs> that they ended up um, making a cauldron out of. Nice. Uh, and I'm going to uh, call out the uh, woven reed tools. Okay. Because I think seeing that kind of thing in another context would be uh, really interesting. Every time I think about those reeds, I just, like, I get this feeling in my fingers of, like, sharpness. Have you ever, like, touched sawgrass or like lemongrass yeah it's Ugh. not it's not pleasant yeah and so weaving those things into hmm i think i if we end up picking the next the next page i think i know where we might end up but um so before we get to questions i'm going to wrap this up for the podcast the way that we always do mm -hmm. thank you for building this world with me <laughs> thank you for building this world with me tracy <laughs> and uh where can we find you online uh you can find me online at the other tracy that is t-r-a-c-y where can people find you online uh, i'm army of meat uh pretty much everywhere um yeah and we have a Patreon that is patreon.com slash Tracy Barnett. Uh, it helps support us doing this show. It yeah. helps me make small games. And uh, all of Kate's money gets donated to Kaleidoscope Youth Center in Columbus, Ohio, which is a nonprofit for LGBTQ queer youth. Uh, so uh, support there goes to support that. Yeah. And thanks for OrcaCon for having us. Yeah, very much. This has been uh, awesome. And with that... Uh, anyone out there? You got about, we have about 15 minutes left. Does anyone have any questions? If not, no big deal, but I just want to give the chance. Yes, uh, the girlfriend in the front row. <laughs> uh, if, if someone was to come to you and say, I've never heard your podcast before, where should I start? Where would you have them start listening? At the beginning? Is there somewhere you feel like you really hit a stride where you'd have them start? Because a lot of your episodes are self contained yeah, I think... So we need to repeat the question real quick for yes. the recording. So the question was, if someone was going to start... If someone asked, where we, should we start with the podcast, what would we suggest? Yeah. Um, I, I think pretty much anywhere would be an okay place to pick up because there are very few situations that require prior knowledge that yeah. we don't cover. Um, like, if we're making a call back to another episode, we'll try to give the context for it because... Uh, to be perfectly candid, we don't remember half the time what the mm -hmm. context is, and yeah. so we have to remind each other. And I would say I might actually start with episode two mm -hmm. just because we really hit our stride well with that episode, and it's a really cool one that gives solid callbacks to the previous episodes. So you're grounded in all the concepts, but it's not that sort of first effort Mm -hmm. where we were feeling out 
everything. So, there, honestly, there would just be bad episodes to start with. Like, don't start with the Scoundrel series. You're not going to understand where that, where that dude comes from. I mean, honestly, you could start because, again, our episodes are, they have a genesis, but that is purely the sort True. of, like, starting point. Because, as, like, as, uh, as is evident today. Yeah, like, we started with paper food containers, but we did not dwell on paper food containers much. No, we it, made a beautiful context for them. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if there's a topic that sounds interesting, go for it. Because it has roots to what came before and uh, branches out to what could come next. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm interested in your, your process. Uh, when do you decide that instead of adding details, you ask the other one questions? How, how do you work that out? Uh, so uh, so the, the question was, um, how does our process work? Uh, how do we choose when to stop adding details and to ask the other person uh, to, to jump in? Uh, We're both just kind of... We, we work well together. <laughs> we do. Um, we, we had this uh, discussion last night, actually. This is... Like, this is only the second day that I've met Tracy in human flesh here. Yeah. Uh, so we, we kind of debriefed last night, and uh, it, it's a really interesting dynamic that we have um, because uh, my natural tendencies are to broaden the world by um, kind of pulling threads out and then, like, uh, focusing on more structural or, like, uh, symbolic connections to other things and then like leaving a bunch of stuff out and then when I've grown tired of that and I want someone to do something with all of the the mess I've made I hand it over to Tracy and I just start weaving details together in ways that sound interesting to me and the thing that's important for me is if I don't know how to answer a question I'm just gonna say I don't know how to answer this what do you think like, when it comes down to it, if we're not listening to each other and building off of what the other person has said or asked, then the whole thing would fall apart. So, honestly, we got lucky finding each other for this process because we clicked from the jump with yeah. this. Yeah, it's, um, I think part of it is that we're both humble enough to to believe that our contributions are not the end all be all and that we're genuinely excited in what the other person is going to add to the conversation because yeah. then that gives us more fodder to keep building new things because like if Tracy didn't add XYZ I wouldn't be able to be like oh okay and then that becomes blah. Right. And to you know call our humility and humbleness into question we're both really smart too and so we have a lot of similar experiences to draw on and enough of very different ones to bring in weird esoteric things from whatever we both have happened to read about once online and you know we'll also double check each other uh, i'll say i think it's like this is that does that seem accurate mm -hmm. you know so it it works well i'm happy <laughs> yeah. uh anyone else The question was, have we ever uh, used this process to sort of um, detail the stories that people within the context of the setting would tell each other to like create? Specifically, like what I find dissatisfying about a lot of creative worlds is their system of gods don't seem like I believe the society really believes in these gods. Sure. Where, so, where this process might end up with something better. So the comment was um, like in a lot of uh, systems, it doesn't seem like the gods actually like make sense for the the people in that world. Mm -hmm. um, I th I think for for the approach that we take, because we build from the ground up, like everything that we that we end up creating is rooted in like the fundamentals of the world. So mm -hmm. because tributaries work a certain way, because like there are certain minerals in the bones, like. If these people had a god, if we ended up creating a god for these people, 
it would be rooted in all of the like very grounded bits of um, like world facts that we've established. And it would lend it a weight to their beliefs because like these people probably wouldn't believe in a very like uh, a feat artistic God, right? Like one that was like all about like ephemeral acts of, of poetry. Um, the, these seem a much more practical people than that. Yeah, and, and religions, uh, especially older religions in our world, come from the cultural context that people have in a given society. So anything that we create would spring from that. Like in the early episodes, one of the, the first things we came up with was an idea of embodied spirits. That we know there are spirits that exist in this world. We know that they can and do take on physical form as they like accrete physical matter into their beings. We also know there is a church that hates that. Those are things that we have come up with just as a matter of detailing these pages. So if we ever went in with the intent of building a pantheon for a society, we'd take much the same process where we'd probably go back to a page we already explored and yeah. say, here's our snapshot of the society. What do these people believe in? Yeah. And how do, do, how do their actions and how do their uh, interactions with everything around them in the world shape what they view, how they view things metaphysically? That, that'd be the approach that we would take because without those underpinnings, you get exactly what you've talked about, which is things that just don't seem believable. Yeah, I, if you were to apply these techniques to your own world building, um, I would say uh, chain your concepts together. So if you have uh, like a certain world setting that has certain problems, what, how would people view these problems? What gods would they appeal to to solve these problems for them? Who then would like f worship these gods? Who would not worship these gods? Uh, who, after they worshiped these gods, moved somewhere else and then had to adapt those beliefs to a new environment? And so like yeah. by taking, by, by asking these questions at every step, you can add a certain amount of like solidity to these beliefs and to this world building that you're doing. And you can do that in reverse as well. If you've got a scene in your mind that's like a high priest up on an altar and they're dressed like this and that and it just looks cool to you, start interrogating why all of those things are in place. What does, what does their garb mean? Like, and that's, if, if we had had, uh, if our page had been an out of place priest, mm -hmm. like that's exactly where we would start is like, what does this person look like? What do these things mean? Yeah. And what, why is it all out of place? Establish the context around it. Yeah, and what sort of people, like if, if our system has any failing, um, it is that everything that we do is very grounded in sort of human psychology uh, and because we like to create relatable concepts and relatable characters and, and relatable worlds, um, we don't go too far afield from things that we as people can't understand. Yeah. So we're not doing like infinite fractal, like crystal universes that like blah. Um, but that said, uh, yeah, I, I would just ask the human questions. Ask, ask, how does this affect people? What, how does this affect how people interact with one another, how does, it, how does it affect what they believe? Yep. Anything else anyone has? If not, then thank you all very much for uh, attending. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Y'all are lovely. And um, definitely subscribe to the podcast. Yep, rate and review, all that good stuff. But thanks. And uh, yeah. <laughs> um, thanks to you, Tracy, for for bringing all this here. Um, Tracy's gonna be here the rest of the con, uh, playing, uh, like running some of your games. Yeah, I've got uh, two sessions of Iron Edit Accelerated and then I'm doing a, a play test of a world building thing, uh, but I'll be around in general. Uh, Kate will be here-ish, maybe, no? Probably I'll, not. I'll be, I'll be around, but I can't promise anything. I won't be running any games or anything, but. Oh, yeah. um, yeah, look us up if you see us in the hall and yeah, say or hi. Or say, say hey on Twitter. All right.